Welcome to episode five of Photo Mind Talks. Thanks so much for joining us. We have a very special guest today. Um, unlike some of our guests in the past, uh, today's guest actually, I have somewhat of a personal connection to, uh, which we'll get into a little bit. But uh, without further ado, uh, Brad Zarlin. Brad, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, hey, Matt, you know, thanks for uh, inviting me or, or finding me, uh, in, you know, in, uh, on the net. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to meet you too. Um, so, you know, most people, I, when I say most people, I, none of y'all will know that actually the way I found Brad, um, you know, Brad's kind of got a really interesting story uh, that goes back to archiving some other things. But uh, so I found Brad actually about a month ago or so, um, where uh, my grandmother is a Holocaust survivor. And I found this one recording of her where she was giving a testimonial over the phone. And I saw that Brad was the interviewer and I thought, oh, you know, there's gotta be something here. Maybe I can find a way to speak to him. And I found him just kind of, you know, through the internet. But um, Brad, I, you know, I, I, got, I guess we gotta start. How does, how does a hedge fund manager, you know, become, uh, become an interviewer of Holocaust survivors? How did you get started with all this? Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't my initial intention. I, I was on the internet. I, I was looking up a book that was unrelated to the Holocaust. And there was, I saw there was something on the same page that it, it was a four volume set of books called the Holocaust Registry. And it listed the names of all the survivors who were alive in 2000. I said, wow, that's kind of interesting. And it said it, you could find it in 10 libraries around the country. And one of which was Toro Law School. And Toro Law School, it was, it was near where I lived at the time. And I think it was founded by religious Jews. So yeah, I, I went over there. It wasn't in the greatest neighborhood and I had to kind of sneak in you know, past the guards because you know, I wasn't a student. So you know, I, I found that they had several you know, big rooms. They're all filled with Jewish books. And a lot of them, most of them I think were on the Holocaust. And it looked like none of them had been read. You know, they were just there on these shelves neatly, and but I, I think sense that they were being used. So I found these the Holocaust registry, and I said, you know, look, you know, it might be interesting to try to interview one person, you know, while these people, you know, are here, you know. So I uh, I copied a few pages, and you know, my last name begins with Z, so I always give preference to the end of the alphabet. Because yeah, I know what it's like, you know, we're always the last. And so I copied, you know, some, you know, Z pages. And um, I, I think maybe I copied pages from uh, like people who were in Auschwitz. So, um, you, know, you know, I did that. I went home and so I went to Radio Shack and I bought a uh, like a suction cup that, you know, attached, you know, to uh, the receiver of the phone and, you know, it could record a call. And it was like ten dollars, and so I, I so anyway, so I, I found this guy named Chaim who was in Charleston in, in South Carolina, and I you know I, I called him up. He he was in about the most camps I could find. I believe he was in at least ten camps. So I I, I called him up and I told him who I was. I asked him if he would do an interview, and you know, he agreed. And I talked to him in I don't know two or three times for about three and a half hours. And he had these unbelievable stories, even after having interviewed all the people I've interviewed, you know, over the last 16 years, his story had some really extreme things, you know, in it. So, you know, I remember, you know, he was on a lot of these death marches and, and he figured out that he should always march in the very front row because they would never take out, they would treat people a little bit better who were in the front row. You know, they wouldn't take them out and kill them or something. And I, I remember he was once on a, uh, a coal car, um, leaving one of the camps and it was you know below zero and, and there was a, a German capo next to him who didn't feel well you know I guess he was like a political prisoner and so the capo told asked Chaim for his blanket and Chaim knew if he gave him his blanket he would die so he fought the capo and he threw the capo off the uh, uh, the coal car and the Germans, you know, machine gun, you know, the, the capo. But I remember during the interview, he said, you know, he, you know, you have to realize that someone who survived, you know, at least 10 concentration camps and lost every member of their family, 160 people, they think that they're even on another level than most Holocaust survivors. 
that they really know how to manipulate people to, to get what they want. You know, though, so at the end of the interview, I, I said, how many times, you know, have you been interviewed? He said, never. So I couldn't believe it. You know, I mean, I just heard, I mean, what, what I heard was extremely important, you know, from a historical standpoint and, and this information is going to get lost. So, you know, I, I said to myself, look, you know, I, I do stuff with the stock market, you know, and, you know, I could usually find some time, you know, during the day or whenever. And, you know, why don't I, I'm not religious. And so I said, you know, I'll make this, and, yeah, and it's always been important for me to do things, you know, to create value. You know, my father had died a couple of years before and he was, he was, he was a very popular guy. And, you know, and then once he died, suddenly, you know, I didn't hear any more about him. So I thought, you know, you know, these people, you know, they suffered tremendously. And, you know, if I could spend, you know, a few hours with them and record their story, you know, that would be, you know, a nice thing to do. So, you know, I, I said, look, you know, I'm going to try to see if I can interview a thousand people. So, you know, I, you know, I, so after that, you know, I, I continued, you know, with, uh, with the project. Um, and it's funny because when I went to school, I was the worst interviewer. I mean, the worst, I would never say the right thing to anyone, you know, <laughs> I, you know, you couldn't get worse than me. So anyway, so, you know, I, I think that people are generally interested in the Holocaust because it impacted them directly. That's, that's the main reason that you are interested in the Holocaust, okay? Uh, you know, if you talk to someone who's, you know, if I, if I meet someone who's Jewish and I tell them, you know, what I did and they were not impacted by it directly, they sure don't even ask me any questions. They might say, oh, that's great. You would think, oh, hey, you know, how could I listen to them? You know, what, you know, it, it wasn't like that at all. And, and, you know, and, and I think that the people who are interested in, in the Holocaust are generally, they typically, um, they can relate to it some way. And they're typically the people who uh, were themselves a subject of prejudice. You know, uh, you know African-Americans are generally very interested in the Holocaust. You know, when you, you know, when I would interview people and they say they would go to schools and talk to uh, um, students, African Americans stood out because they dealt with a lot of prejudice. Um, and it's sort of another thing that's kind of interesting is I never liked history in school because uh, I always had very sloppy handwriting and you always had to write essays. And if you have really sloppy handwriting, the, the teacher can't read it, so it's pretty pointless. And, and, and then going back again, you know, my last name begins with a Z, so I'd be sitting in the back row. You know, and I couldn't see what was going on. And, uh, you know, my hearing wasn't always the greatest. And, I, you know, and I was also always had this suspicion when I was that a lot of famous people aren't always the nicest people in real life. I don't I think that's probably true. Some of them are very nice, but I have a feeling a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, maybe they did a lot of great things. But but the Holocaust was different. This was really ordinary people. This was people just like, you know, you and I, and all of a sudden, you know, the governments turned on them and uh, the people around them turned on them and the world built factories literally just to kill them, to process killing them and to, to take everything, you know, that, that they had. So. Wait, hang on. So, so you, you really didn't have any interest in history before this, but then you just kind of, you became essentially like a keeper of the history. I mean, that's, that's a yeah, crazy I mean, jump. Yeah, you, you can ask me, I don't want you to, but if you ask me certain basic questions, you know, about the war, World War II, or it's, I, it's a big chance I'm not going to know what you're talking about. Um, so, <laughs> wait, so how many, how many survivors have you interviewed in total? Um, I, somewhere, uh, I think, completed interviews, I think, like about 1,830 wow. or something like that. And then there's wow. another around, I'm not sure, but somewhere around 300 where they don't finish the interview. You know, there were a lot of people and you'd start to interview them and, and they would quit. Um, and why, uh, why would they quit? Was it like you were in touch with them on kind of, they would be like, I think I'm done with this. Or was it more of like a, you'd start and just kind of couldn't reach them almost. You know, maybe they couldn't fall asleep that night. Uh, maybe their kids, they told, spoke to the kids about it and they said, what do you need this for? Um, you know, or, uh, a lot of them would, you know, I would ask them questions about their childhood. And then when it got to the war, you know, they might stop. Um, 
there were people, there was a guy that I was interviewing fairly recently. He was close to 100 and he had to go in for a procedure and he didn't make it, you know. So, he, right. Uh, um, and, and, you know, there, there, there are a lot of different reasons. And, but actually, some of those incomplete interviews ended up being important for various, you know, reasons. So, so how, how did you, when did you start this exactly? Are you still working on it also? I started it this summer, um, will be 16 years that I've been wow. doing it, you know, in, in my spare time. Uh, so I started it in, in 2006. What were the reactions you had from people when you reached out to them? Um, you know, obviously you probably kind of found, I, I'm assuming, I mean, I'd love if you share also about how you kind of track down these survivors for the interviews, but also, you know, in addition, like how, uh, you know, how receptive were they to this, you know, when you, you know, a stranger essentially just kind of reaching out to them about this, you know, something so personal. Um, <laughs> that, that's a good question. In, in the beginning, I had, you know, uh, you know, problems, you know, about one in 10 families, you know, you would get hostility, you know, you would get yelled at by the children. Um, you know, I mean, I, I could tell you stories, you know, they wouldn't believe, <laughs> you yeah. know, you know, saying who gives you the right to do this? You invaded our family's privacy. You, uh, but then you know, and people were very suspicious. You know, why am I doing this? You know, who you know, because people generally do things because they're trying to you know get money from it. They're gonna you know make a movie or, and you know, it, it took years. You know, in the beginning for you know, uh, you know, and then eventually you know with the internet, people figure out who you are, and you know, I, I had a you know, a relative who I interviewed, you know, her parents and, you know, some of the survivors knew her and, and then, you know, they realized that I was okay. You know, that I wasn't trying to hurt them. And, you know, I wasn't looking to, for their social security number to steal their money or, or anything like that. Um, so it, it, now I, it's extremely rare that I have a problem. Um, you know, I can't see what's going on on the other end, but it, it seems like it's very uh, um, like these people are educated on the questions I'm going to ask them and how to behave, you know, when I call, you know, to, and so it, it seems like it's a lot more organized. It's not as random as it was in the beginning, but, you know, in the beginning, when I started, people were a lot more um, uh, forthcoming in terms of their experiences, you know, like they would say, you know, at the end of the, the war, they, they, they found me on a pile of dead bodies and, the, and they saw my eye move, okay? But then when they saw that their, maybe their grandchildren are going to hear this, they toned it down, okay? So you don't hear as much about that the, the guard beat me up and I lost my teeth and, and how painful it was because they don't want their, their relatives to hear that. So, you know, that, that's a problem too. Um, and, and if they already going through the questions, they tend to, they would start answering certain questions like in the same way, because, you know, you know <laughs> um, like, like one question, you know, it's just, you know, it's a minor thing, you know, sometimes, you know, I'd ask them to their father, you know, what kind of hat he wore. And, you know, so, so now a lot of, sometimes they'll go into, you know, it was a Bieber hit, it was this, or, but, but now they, uh, a lot of them will say uh, a regular hat. I guess somehow they've all <laughs> learned to say that, you know, the, the, the same thing. It's interesting that you say that because uh, one of the things I actually found most interesting for my grandmother's, um, my grandmother's interview is that, you know, we talked about this before, but um, I, I, the, my, the only experience I'd had with my grandmother's story was she sat me down and made, made me watch her um, USC uh, Shoah Foundation, which was, you know, funded by Steven Spielberg as a way to record as many survivors as possible. Um, so I watched, I watched her tape and, and she was really, you know, really sharp about uh, the details of her story when she told it then. But I noticed when on her call with you, she was, she was a lot less sharp. And I mean, granted, at least 10 years had passed since, um, you know, since she first told her story in this, in this kind of fashion. Um, so it was interesting to see almost have time kind of, shifted the story a little bit you know she'd forget details a little bit here and there kind of mix up the order maybe forget a sibling's name or so um so it's interesting to see 
how, uh, you know, the, the details do shift for so many different reasons, right? Like time and, you know, trying to water it down for the family, perhaps a little bit. Um, it's, it's, I can only imagine how, you know, how tough it was to go through, you know, so many of these interviews. Was there anything, um, you know, was there anything that happened during them that kind of surprised you in a positive way? Um, you, you know, going back, you know, to, to the interviews, you know, I, the average interview I did, you know, was over three hours. And the longest one I did was like 16 hours. The shortest one, you know, was a half hour. And about a third of the people I interviewed, you know, uh, you know, were never interviewed. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, but some of the interviews I did that were incomplete were very important. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, right before COVID, I got contacted by a woman from, in Australia. And she says, I was listening to one of your interviews, you know, on, uh, you know, on the, uh, the uh the washington museum's you know website and there are two boys in the interview and i think one of them could be my father so to make a long story short at the end of the the war her father was an orphan and so he got sent to australia and he eventually you know he, he you know he grew up there and he got married he had children grandchildren and his children thought there was a small chance they could be a relative in the United States. And they've been looking actively for 30 years, no success. And this interview created that link. So all of a sudden, 10 people from Australia were flying to Los Angeles to meet the survivor and a similar amount from New York. And so a whole bunch of first cousins were gonna meet each other, didn't know that they existed. And then COVID happened, so it didn't happen, but then it happened a few months ago. And now these people, you know, have, you know, uh, all these other relatives that they didn't know about. That's amazing. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so if you go back, what, what was your, uh, I was asking, was I mean, that, I feel like that kind of fits in, right? Like I, my question was what were the most surprising pieces of the interviews in like a kind of a positive sense. And that clearly kind of sounds like it, right. Or at least a version of something that was surprising, right. That, the interviews that weren't complete actually led to this, like, you know, especially unific, uh, like essentially a unification of a family. Um, I mean, that's beautiful. Uh, um, but, you know, another surprising thing was sometimes people's, you know, memory and sometimes the, the importance of facts that weren't really important to people. For, I'll give you a good example. So you know, I would try to get like all sorts of, you know, details from people, <laughs> like anything I could. So, um, Sometimes, you know, I'd ask people, you know, did you have a, a telephone before the war? So, you know, one guy, you know, tells me there's a phone before the war. So I go, do you still remember the phone number? And he knew the phone number. And this guy was in a particularly bad places during the war, really some of the worst camps. And, you know, it, it was a it was pretty remote chance that he was going to survive these situations, but he did. So I remember them telling me that when uh, their grandson listened to the interview, the thing by far that most impressed him, you know, not that his grandfather survived like these horrible situation, but that he remembered his phone number from before the war. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so sometimes, you know, the, the you know, facts that, you know, you, they're really not very important, <laughs> you know, it depends on, you know, who's listening and, you know, so, so, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And, and you know, another thing that was surprising was there were sometimes major events that happened to survivors and they never told their children about them. You know, I remember one uh, incident that it, it was a, a woman who uh, during, during the war, they were in the Loja ghetto, you know, in, in Poland and these Germans came in to, in to their apartment to steal stuff. And one of the Germans grabbed the prayer book from the grandmother and was reading the Hebrew. And they learned after the war that that was Adolf Eichmann. Uh, so if you do research on the Holocaust, he, he wanted to learn the language of the people he was going to wipe out. So now this woman who I'd interviewed, her daughter never even knew that story. So let's take, let's take it back a little bit. First of all, so all the interviews are audio, correct? Right? Yeah. They're all over the phone? Okay. And how, so what were you, what were you planning to do with the interviews in the first place? I mean, right? It's not like... Did you just plan to, ha you know, create this archive that just kind of could become 
place that you know these stories can live eventually in some capacity or did you did you know that by the end of this you were planning to you know donate your collection of, of recordings to the holocaust museum um you know it, initially you know i came up with the idea that uh I, I would try to make them available to their families and i thought well okay i'll you know i guess they would all like you know if i gave them to yad vashem so I figured, you know, that, that that would be you know a, a good thing to do. And, you know, I, I was also, you know, when I did the interviews, I purposely didn't listen to like Spielberg's interviews because I wanted to approach it differently. You know, I wanted to ask different questions, have a different angle on it. Um, and, you know, so, you know, initially, in some of the first interviews I did, you know, during the first year, I kind of had to sound like a high school student. I don't know the right question to ask them. Um, you know, when someone tells me they were from a family of nine kids and they're the only survivor, I go, oh, wow, that must be difficult. But, you know, after you're doing it for a while, it becomes, unfortunately, you know, too commonplace and, you know, you, you, it, it becomes more, you know, the norm. Um, and, you know, and I said, you know, in a lot of these people, there are a lot of people who, who don't like talking in front of a camera. To some of the, the reason I was able to interview so many people who never interviewed, there were a lot of people who felt more comfortable, you know, on a, over a telephone. It was anonymous. You know, these people think about this in their heads, okay? And a lot of them don't feel comfortable. You know, if you watch a Holocaust interview and there's someone else in the room, it usually seems like the other person shouldn't be there. It's inappropriate. You know, they're, they're stomping on like holy ground or something. But, you know, there were people who, when they did the interviews with me, they would go into a room, they would turn off all the lights, and they were talking to this piece of plastic. And it was just like talking to them, you know, and, uh, you know, and I was often, you know, you ask, well, how could you listen to all the interviews? In reality, you know, I was often on the internet doing things, you know, while I was interviewing them because I could deal with it that way. You know, I was actually listening intently to every word they said, I would go nuts, you know, so, um, so anyway, so when people and I noticed that people when they would do the interviews on the phone, they were talking longer than they, what they than their Spielberg interviews. I would ask them how long was your interview with Spielberg, so they would say you know two hours, and but they talked to me for three hours. So I was saying you know that's probably there's a lot of you know value there. And uh, there were some interviews that took years to finish. Sometimes like there were people like you couldn't get a hold of them, and they were just you know, and it would take a couple years. Uh, um, so how, how did those interviews change the ones that you know that you had to do over x like x amount of years especially was there any difference kind of how they started how they finished um no not not really no it's pretty uh you know there are just certain people you know they're they're busy you know rabbis husbands you know they're constantly going to different things people right you know another thing with the interviews is that when it's a phone interview it's a lot easier for them to stop OK, you know, a lot of times you hear in the interviews, someone comes running into the room and they, they got to run down to, you know, to dinner or they got to go someplace or, or they have to take care of their husband or something. There, there were people who would do the interviews in 10 minute interview intervals and I talked to them a zillion times, you know, they. Uh, um, I could tell from I could tell from my grandmother's actually that that was a thing where there was a couple times that there was a couple times I don't know what time it was at but she'd just be like uh it's time to go <laughs> you just like she'd just do such a hard cut it was one of those things that my family and I laughed at so much where like her like personality came out like she's like I think I've had enough for today uh it was too funny but uh yeah but I, I mean, it, it makes sense you know one thing you should learn from these interviews is that you know really I mean, you know, a lot of people should be interviewed, you know, not just Holocaust survivors. It's not that hard to do. And, and it's really sad that, you know, when people, you know, or relatives die, that's it. You know, a lot of times, you know, there's no voice about them, who they were. And, you know, lots of people have all sorts of interesting stories, you know, not just, you know, survivors. You know, I'm curious, like what you learned throughout the process. I mean, hey, the pro about the process itself as you were going, maybe, you know, you kind of you kind of learn some way to maybe do it better than when you started, anything like that. But as well as just about the process, I'm curious, you know, maybe what you learned about yourself kind of through this, like, I feel like it's, it's such a, 
right? You're hearing all these personal stories and they're so, so, so heavy. Um, there had to be something that you kind of, you know, learned about yourself kind of throughout this whole thing. Well, one of the things that, that I learned, you know, you would think that because someone went through these extreme situations during the Holocaust, you know, that Hashem, God would be kind to them afterwards. That wasn't always the case. You know, they, unfortunately, they still lived in a real world where, you know, there, there were bad things that happened, you know, to them. And, you know, whether it was, you know, they get sick or, you know, they had a, a child that something happened to them or, and that, that I found that very upsetting. Uh, and I was amazed. It was absolutely astonishing to me that with what these people went through, you know, they lost, you know, most of their families and, and they were almost killed and, you know, they survived the war and they weighed, you know, 70 pounds and they rebounded. And, you know, I mean, you know, with some help, you know, they, they, you know, they, they, they went to places, you know, like Canada or, uh, you know, you know to Palestine or Israel or, or the United States. And they were able to, you know, get married and, and, and learn a new language and, you know, be in a, a totally foreign environment and to succeed, you know, to have children, grandchildren and great children. I mean, it's really, you know, I mean, I'm sure you could see that in your family. You know, I don't know if you really appreciated that growing up, but I mean, you know, what your grandmother went through and the fact that she was able to, you know, to, to come back from that, you know, really uh, amazing. Um, um, no, I'm, I'm curious what, uh, you know, like, like I said, like you've been, you know, you've been talking about, you know, all these, you know, the atrocities that you learned and along the way after, you know, story after story, but like there had to be, what were the highlights for you from this whole process? I mean, there had to be something that, you know, every time that you picked up the phone to make the next, uh, the next call that you were like, okay, like this is, this is good. You know, I, I mean, I thought it was really great to see the people, you know, there are people who, you know, appreciated what I did. You know, I, I mean, I put a lot of uh, effort into this and, you know, it was nice to see that, you know, people listening to the interviews that, uh, you know, sometimes when I would send people, you know, an interview, they would send it out, you know, to all the relatives immediately and everyone would listen to it. Um, and it was nice sometimes, I, I didn't get as much as I thought I would, but it, it was always nice to get feedback from people about things that they learned from the interview. And, uh, um, you know, some, a lot of, actually a fair amount of the interviews were transcribed, sometimes in different languages, sometimes into Hebrew, and to, um, some of them were turned into books, you know, and then they would send me a copy of the book, which was very nice. Um, I also, it was always an amazing experience. Sometimes when I would interview them, they didn't give me the kids' contact information so I could send them the, you know, the interview. So I, I would notice a few years later that, you know, that they had, you know, had passed away. So I'd look up their, their kid, you know, and, and so I would call him up and I'd say, hi, you know, is this uh, Moshe Schwartz's son? Yeah. Was he a Holocaust survivor? Yeah. Was he ever interviewed? No. Then I send them a six hour interview and they're absolutely blown away. I did a, a lot of times. Um, so that, that was really, uh, you know, an amazing experience to do that, you know, because they had thought, you know, the story had been lost and it was gone. That's great. I actually, I, I just realized we, we actually didn't talk about it. I'm curious so much about, uh, I'm, I'm really, really curious about how you actually track down these people, you know, like to, to track down almost, you know, 2000 plus people, like where, where are you getting that? What is it like from, I don't know, from like registries from different places? Like, how are you, how are you finding everyone? Um, so initially I, I copy pages from that book, you know, I would go to right. that tour of law school and I, I would, you know, it divided people up, you know, into different sections. So, you know, initially I call people who were in Auschwitz and I'd have to look up their phone numbers on the internet, which was tedious, you know, because a lot of them had already died. They were in a nursing home. They're hard to get a, a hold of. And you can only call up numbers, you know, really what people had unusual names. You know, if the guy's name was David Schwartz, you're not going to call him. You know, there's zillions of them. So you had to call up, you know, you know people with, uh, and, you know, from my experience of having been in the brokerage industry, I knew how to ask for referrals. You know, and generally, the people who were the most helpful to this project were the survivors themselves and sometimes their children. Um, and that was who 
help me really to do the project, okay? Other people were not generally very helpful. Um, it was, it was, I find that kind of unfortunate, but, but they, you know, but the survivors, you know, go to, you know, they would go to their phone book and, you know, they would find me, you know, 10 names and numbers. Uh, there were a handful of people who were amazingly helpful, um, you know, who would give me, you know, tons of people and other people, you know, they would realize what they just went through with my, you know, six hour interview with them. It's, I'm not giving it to anyone else. You know, I wouldn't want that. So I said, well, give me, give me the, the, the people, you know, that you don't like. I, mean, I could call them too, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the same thing. <laughs> they generally had a pretty good sense of humor, most of, most of the survivors, you know, um, and you need a sense of humor to really, to be able to tell you, you know, to tell your story. So what do you, what do you hope that people will take from these interviews in the future? Right. I imagine that there's, you know, you said, even though you said in the beginning that it was kind of, you were just hoping to be able to send them to, uh, you know, to the families, but now that they're, you know, publicly available, uh, what do you hope that people get from this in the future? Well, I mean, you know, you know, you hope that it keeps these stories alive, you know, for future generations. Um, and, and one of the things that it really does is that it makes these families, you know, the children, grandchildren, you know, down the line, appreciate it. That it wasn't a free ride, you know, that they made it, you know, to wherever Israel or, or Canada or the United States, that their family had major, major sacrifices. And, you know, and without recording these stories, the people really, you know, the relatives a lot of times didn't know. I mean, I remember running into these two, uh, you know, they were Orthodox, uh, you know, uh, people and, and their grandparents had been in the Holocaust. They didn't even know if they were in concentration camps. You know, they didn't even know, know basic stories. Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting is, is that most Holocaust survivors don't understand Google. Okay. So what that means is that when they're telling their stories, you can check out, you can check up on what they're saying. You know, so, you know, we went, you know, it was 20 kilometers here. So someone, you could go on and see if that was true. And you could also just, you know, the reason I would try to get lots of details from them is because you could, that could generate, open up all sorts of interesting things on the internet. You, you know, like, you know, if someone mentions who their best friend was during the war, you know, maybe you could find out, maybe you'll find out that, you know, you know, his grandchildren live a couple blocks from you or something. Uh, so, you know, they're all kind of, um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, you know, a lot of these interviews brought closure to the families. Um, you know, the biggest, you know, I was able to get the story to them and, you know, it was a relief to, to you know, to, to know something, you know, about, you know, what happened. Um, you know, there was one guy, I remember I tried to interview him. I, I didn't get to interview him, but I remember he said something that really stuck out. He said the reason he's not going to do the interview is that the interviews are going to turn into a form of entertainment for people. And if you really think about it, there's a lot to be said for what he was saying. You know, a lot of these things, you know, they're, they're on, uh, you know, they're, they're turned into movies and they're excited that someone escaped from here. And, you know, but and, and that kind of, you know, it kind of gets away from maybe the core, you know, reason why, you know, you're documenting these things. You know, and, you know, the main reason is theoretically you'd like that people would educate themselves and that you don't want it to happen again. And, you know, there were other interviews, sadly enough, that no one really ever listened to. You know, there was, uh, you know, there's no one ever, you know, heard them. Maybe they didn't have relatives or whatever. And not all the relatives were always interested in the stories. You, know, you would think that they should all be, right? You heard your, that was pretty interesting stuff you heard, right? With your grandmother, you would think that, you know, who, who wouldn't be interested, but. But you know what? Um, even though, even though, even though, someone no or no one might have might ever hear them, uh, you know that they even exist in a recorded form, right? That they are that they're saved somewhere where if somebody wanted to, that they could find them. It's better that it's saved than it's not a, not said at all. And you know that's I think that's what it comes down to with these Holocaust testimonials is you know making making sure people really understand the atrocities, and it doesn't matter if nobody hears it. Um, that it exists and that people can still find it, I think is, you know, arguably the most valuable piece of it all.
Yeah, you know, what I'm happy about is that, you know, the museum in Washington, the, the, the interviews being there, it's a safe place. They make them available on the internet. So people do find them. You know, you found, you know, that interview. Um, you know, someone contacted me within the last month that uh, they found that I had interviewed their grandmother, but only uh, till the war began. Then she stopped, but she never talked about the war at all. And they were so happy about this. You know, to me, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that big a deal, but to them, it was a huge deal. You know, here she was talking about her childhood and they learned, you know, you know, all these things, you know, that, you know, that, that she had to use, you know, uh, you know, newspaper, you know, for toilet paper and all these other things that they, they didn't know about. I remember there were two people who sent me money after I did their interviews. One guy sent me $50 and one guy sent me a hundred. I, I didn't cash their checks. Um, and, uh, <laughs> so funny. Uh, okay. Here, here's a funny story. Okay. So <laughs> I called this guy to interview him, you know, so I go, hi, you know, I don't remember his name, but you know, hi is, uh, is Moshe Schwartz there? Uh, yes, is and the person answered. Yeah, this is Moshe Schwartz. Said, oh, said, okay. Um, and so I said, uh, you know, can I? You know, I told him who I was. I asked, you know, if, if I can interview him. He said, sure. So you know, I call back and I started to interview Moshe. And you know, he's a religious guy. He was, you know, Orthodox. And well, he came from an Orthodox family. I don't know if he was. And 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 he uh, said. You know, I'm asking questions and I said, you know, well, how tall are you? He said, you know, five feet. Okay. You know, some of the, you know, next generation, they could be kind of tall. And, you know, I'm asking him about his life before the war. And it was really odd. You know, all this guy's friends were women. You know, that, that didn't happen. Man. I said, this guy must, he must have been a stud. He was, he was what's, you know, and, and, and it was also strange that he was religious. He wasn't bar mitzvah. I said, well, what's going on? So what I found out going into maybe, and it was a fairly, into the interview, a fair amount. I don't know, maybe, you know, it could have been 45 minutes, an hour, that it wasn't him. It was his wife. They were like 100. And when you get really old, you could sound like, you know, if you're a woman and you're like 98, you could sound like a man. So, <laughs> so, so that was why <laughs> Moshe was five feet and all his friends were and he wasn't bar mitzvah. <laughs> I couldn't, you know, it was the funniest thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> was, was, was his wife was his wife also a survivor or she no, was no, just he telling... was dead he wasn't alive anymore <laughs> but when she would pick up the phone <laughs> and people would ask him she would say that she was him oh, you know wow. the son when i spoke to him he said yeah sometimes she she does that but you know but sometimes very old people you know they can sound like some of the opposite you know their voices change and she, you know, her voice she could have been you know, I could figure out you know I, I just hope that you know people you know, get value from these interviews, which I think they will. And, you know, I'm kind of excited that, you know, I did something people are going to know about my work and, you know, assuming that humans are around in a hundred years, um, you know, that they'll be listening to these things. And, you know, we can only hope, you know, again, you know, the Holocaust, you know, that it's not going to happen again, but it seems like that's not going to be the case, unfortunately, because there are really bad things going on, you know, all over the world today. Um, which is, you know, unfortunate, but, you know, maybe we can prevent this from happening to Jews in the future. I, I don't know, but, you know, just hopefully. Uh, well, we can hope, know. we can hope for good things, man. Anything, any, uh, maybe we can end on a nice positive note. Anything, uh, any last words before we go? Um, no, I think that, you know, hopefully, you know, that, that you learn some things and you could take some things from this interview and actually do something with it. You know, trying to do something, you know, that uh, it'll make your kids, you know, more empathetic or to be helpful to other people and, you know, be kind to people around you, you know, whether they're handicapped or other things. And, you know, the, you know, people, you know, it's not an easy uh, trip, you know, life, you know, it's a, it's a difficult thing. And, uh, you know, try, you know, you know, there, there are people that, you know, who, you know, they, they you know, in order to maintain their relationship with you. They always got to call you on the phone. You should call them too. You know, I think that's important. I completely agree. I think on that note, uh, it's a great place to, for us to finish off this episode of the podcast. So thank you so much, Brad, for- yeah, uh, Thanks you know, a lot, Matt. Yeah. This is my thanks. first interview I ever did, so. <laughs> You're, you crushed it. You really, you really crushed it. I appreciate, you know, I appreciate you coming on to talk with me as well as, 
you know, from the family of, Surv of Survivor, um, you know, obviously I very much appreciate and thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to speak to not only my grandmother, but to, you know, almost 2,000 other survivors. So, uh, you know, thank you so much. Um, on that note, we're, this is, uh, we're gonna close this episode of Photo Mind Talks. Uh, again, thanks so much to Brad for being here and we hope you tune in next time. Thank you. Thank All you right, very much. Awesome.